Okay. Perfect. So I, today I wanted to cover uh, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, I felt this was a pretty decent topic as we're coming into the uh, <coughs> potential for car crashes and people slipping and falling outside. It kind of is how to recognize types of head injuries and see what the uh, some of the signs and symptoms may actually be when you come in contact with. There are some things that are not listed in the presentation, but things I can point out to you when we start talking about uh, Cushing's triad and things like that uh, to kind of determine intracranial pressure increases and then we can get that more later on. So to the classroom, what is a traumatic brain injury? What is it? An injury to the brain. It's a injury caused by some sort of trauma okay. that can affect the normal function of the brain. Perfect. All right, so we can have two different types of brain injury or head type of head traumas. We can have a closed brain injury and an open. So what, what might you suspect seeing a closed head injury? Deformity on the outside. Okay, deformity, anything on a palpation, like the decrepitus of the skull, right? Um, other things to look for maybe is uh, raccoon eyes. Right, raccoon eyes are really an indication of an orbital fracture, but if they don't have any pain, like around the orbit itself, but you see a lot of pooling of blood and you see a lot of black and blue, that could be an indication of some type of bleed in the brain, uh, depending on where the injury is, where they fell. Uh, so other indications of that would be, could be, which is called? Yep. CSF? CSF. CSF. Uh, so cerebral spinal fluid, looking for that clear fluid. Um, and remember there is a way to check that as well, Called a halo test. You ever heard of the halo test before? No. Yes. That's when you collect the cerebral spinal fluid and you onto a uh, two, like a two by two or a four by four, and what happens is the blood will separate from the fluid itself and makes like a golden ring around it. As you can usually tell, it's cerebral spinal fluid. <coughs> Please not take the time on scene to check for that. Something out of ear is a rapid transport. Is going to the hospital. Uh, we'll talk more about closed brain injuries later on when we start talking about nursing homes and falls. And then we have open brain injuries. Obviously, anything that's open that we can see. So there's two different types. So the closed head injury uh, resulting from falls, motor vehicle crashes, will cause a lot of focal damage and uh, diffuse damage to the axions in the brain. And also effect, um, effects tend to be broad, but there's also no penetration to the actual skull. So to kind of go more in depth on this part of it, um, we look at falls as a very one of the, our, our biggest culprits of brain injuries, right? So if we have a lady who fell, or a male who fell and hit their head. Is that really is that considered a brain type of injury? Could be, Could be right? I mean, it's still trauma to the head. It's still head trauma, but it might not be as bad. However. The older we get, the more prone to injury we are, right? And the more chances we're going to have a significant type of head trauma. So what are some medications that the patient could be on, especially when they start getting older, that could make head injuries worse? Blood thinners. Blood thinners, right? So what we'll see in nursing homes is, oh, well, they had a fall a week ago, but now they're just, they're not seeming right. They're all, I'm really not sure what's going on. What does that usually indicate? It's a sort of bleed, right? It's a sort of a head injury. <coughs> it's we look for. So that's why questioning these patients or our, 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 our staff are very important to get a good history. A lot of what just happened today, what's happened in the last two weeks to these patients. You could transport a patient from a nursing home or a home who had a fall. A head CT can be done. They can show nothing. It can be clean. But a week later, they're altered. They start, they're, you start seeing the, the gaze of the eyes right to the other left, depending on where the injury is located, and it almost looks like a stroke. But in all reality, they had a slow bleed that the CT didn't pick up because it was, it was, it was such a small bleed but over time, and being on blood thinners, they didn't have a chance to clot and heal. So you start seeing all the mental status in patients. So really, closed head injuries are kind of dangerous stuff. Another thing with closed head injuries is it also creates pressure. ICP, 
endocranial pressure. So what are the things you look for to determine intracranial pressure? High blood pressure. Pupil response. Pupil response, right? What else? What are the three things for Cushing's triad? Do you remember what that is? Anybody remember that one? You kind of shook your head a little bit on that one. Like, yeah, kind of, right? No, but I always forget it. Right. So we have... Uneven respirations. Regular respirations is one. Tachycardia. Bradycardia. Bradycardia is two. And what's the third one? Increasing blood pressure. Blood pressure changes, right? So we have the three different things to look for in what they call Cushing's triad. All right. So we started seeing the bradycardia, especially in the respiratory pattern. We started seeing um, potential for increased respirations as well. We started seeing different types of respirational patterns. These are indications of significant intracranial pressure in someone's brain. All right, nothing that we can do to fix it in the field, but something good to pick up on to pass along to the hospital that you have a traumatic brain injury this one time. All right, let's move forward. So as you can see here in different parts of the brain, this is kind of like a cut open uh, point of this. So you can see your parietal lobe, you can see your temporal, you can see your frontal lobe and your occipital lobe here, right? So you kind of see where they're all, where all located. <laughs> and remember that every different area has a different function. So if you look at, if you hit the back of your head, one of the questions you can ask is, is your, blurry, is your vision blurry? Right, because your vision control center is controlled out here and I'll a look. Here's a picture of the axonal shearing uh, that you would have, um, which occurs in acceleration as well as acceleration injuries. Uh, so you're here, the nerve fibers may be stretched or completely severed or severed, producing a, uh, the manifestations of diffuse head injuries. So you have the decreased mental status, you'll have uh, increased pressures, and things like that that can cause just not having these types of damages to the brain. An open head injury is result from a bullet wound, uh, hatchet to the head, you know, things like that, where you have a large, very large focal damage area. These are easier for us in a roundabout way because we can actually see where things went in and we can see where the wounds are. We can treat the wounds and things like that. Obviously, we want to do sutures, but we can actually start doing some treatments. We can see really what's going on for the most part. Um, the effects of this can definitely be just as serious because we really don't know once it goes through the outside layer where it may have gone. But we know with a bullet, if it goes in, it can ricochet off different parts, right? It's not always a straight in, straight out, as you can see here. Sometimes they can be, sometimes they may not be able to shave off the skull. So it all depends on kind of how it enters and where it goes through the brain and what parts of your anatomy may have as a, as a reaction to the type of injury that you have. So I've had a, to kind of bring up a quick story, um, I had a patient who took a 22, put it right to her head here, and shot herself right here, trying to kill herself, right in the frontal port of the head. What happened was it went through here and came out here and split the top of the head open like this, right? Still breathing, unconscious, but breathing and showing signs of cushions, right? She ended up becoming an organ donor, and she went up to the main medical center in Portland. But... And all, end all be all, though, she still had a pulse, respiration, was blood pressure, it was perfectly normal. You know, so she was still compensating for the injury, even though she was completely brain dead. Uh, so, I'm just going to put, point that out that just because they shoot themselves in the head does not mean they're actually going to be dead. Right? They still are, they still are much alive, just without any kind of functions. It was quite an interesting call. So what happens immediately after a TBI? What happens after that? You start getting tissue damage, you start getting bleeding, you start getting swelling, and these are and these things here, over time, either tend to get worse or can get better. And if they're getting worse, this is where we start seeing changes in mental status, changes in potentially heart rates, blood pressures are more serious, but usually the change in mental status that we need to pick up on. So who in here has ever had a concussion before? 
One for how I'm putting my hand. I played sports. <laughs> I've been knocked out a couple of times. <laughs> Trey, concussions? Never? Oh, goodness. No? 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 You ever fall and hit your head and said, Where am I? No. no. My daughter has. Okay. Wow. So, some things to look for, okay? Those are all still brain injuries, right? <laughs> And if you look at more of the sports stuff, now I know you ref quite a few, quite a few games. Um, when there's a concussion, are they out of the game? Yes. Yeah. Do they? And they, they don't get to come back in. They don't come back in. They don't come back in for weeks. Yeah, weeks if not the rest of the season, <clears throat> depending on the severity of the concussion. There's a whole new concussion protocol. Yeah. That's uh, pretty, pretty impressive, actually. It is very impressive, and they actually make coaches go through concussion signs and symptoms training. Referees as well. Yeah. Yeah. To be able to have the understanding. That goes from PV levels to, to pros. They've got to be able to recognize it. All right. Here's the swelling. So right here is, is one you have some edema located over here. So you notice there's an increased swelling and edema on this side here. You can tell by looking at the actual view on this one here. Uh, you have hematoma here. So what's going on here, right? We have the injury here, right? Right, closed head injury. Hematoma starts building up here. And we're and now remember we can't go through the skull pushing out, it's just pushing on now. Right, right it's pushing on the brain on the soft tissue. It's all from here. Right? So by doing that, by creating that pressure, it's causing our alter mental status. Well in the back right there would be blurred vision. It could be, right. Exactly. <clears throat> So some of the changes in functioning for TBI would be loss of consciousness or coma. Um, other changes uh, due to the TBI would be, we talk about mental status changes, things like that, um, blurry vision, memory loss. So when we assess a patient, we usually check for alertness, orientated, right, using ABCU scale. And we ask them how many questions usually. Four questions, right? Which are person, place, time, and event to kind of determine what's going on now, at the here and now of what they remember, right? But if they have short-term memory loss, they may not, they may give you still the correct answers for CAO times four, but they may not remember things five minutes later. So ask them four more questions, things to remember. Remember, you have to remember these things you asked them, so make it simple, all right? So, usually what I do is, I usually do three different colors, and then I say penny at the end of it. So it's going to be green, blue, purple, penny. Can you remember those four things for me? Repeat them. They go green, blue, purple, penny. Perfect. Write them down somewhere for yourself to remember in five minutes. Right? In five minutes, ask them again. Do you remember? Those four things I told you to remember. And they say, elephant, purple, green, pasta. Whoa, wait a minute here. Something's not right. Now we know that they're having a short-term memory issue, so now we can determine more that there is a brain injury at this point in time. Um, they start asking, if they don't have dementia, and they start asking repeated questions. For those who have been in the ambulance system for a while, right, you <laughs> notice repetitive questioning, right? Where's my dog? Or where are you towing my car? We already told you we're towing the car. Where are you towing my car? We already told you that. You should be able to pick up on that as repeated questioning, right? And with repeated questioning would indicate the TBI. Can light sensitivity also be a sign of TBI? It can be. Yep, so we call it photosensitive. Yeah. But it could also be an indication of meningitis too, so be careful. Uh, but still something to pick up on. I don't like looking at lights. Right. So when you have a brain injury, they really don't mend fully. Okay, the injury is always going to be there. And you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. You mentioned to me earlier about a friend. Yeah. Um, you mind if I talk about that? No, no. I don't no. know who it is, so I mean, obviously, I'm not as far as who it is. A friend of mine was riding his bike in Burlington two years ago and got hit by a driver going 45 miles an hour and then was right head first into a tree. And he was unconscious for probably 40 minutes or something, but he is two years later, he's got. He's got like twitching and he gets really tired. He has to sleep a lot. He has times when he can't talk, times when he can't walk, um, times when he just can't function at all. So it's, 
it's it's ter it's changed his life. He can't work anymore. Uninsured driver. So was he diagnosed with it then? He wasn't. The hospital did a terrible job, and uh, he ended up going down to Boston to um, forget. Uh, it's not for young women's, but one of the hospitals down there where they have TBI. Yeah. Every probably just beside the BI. Hmm? Probably Beth Israel. It's Beth Israel. Yeah, the BI has a trauma, trauma uh, head facility on there. Yeah, really that's, that's the sad part about it. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't thought. It wasn't thought early, and uh, right. there were definitely things that they could have done. And he had a um, broken collarbone. They didn't diagnose that. He had a broken foot. They didn't diagnose that. You know, wow. a lot of issues. But as you can see, though, listening to the story, right, they don't mend fully. It leads to problems in functioning later on. And the reason I asked for photo sensitivity is my, my best friend's girlfriend had um, a concussion. She played <coughs> soccer goalie, indoor soccer. And now, almost two months later, she has to wear sunglasses because she can't, she hasn't yep. adapted to the light. She's a teacher at school, so she has to wear sunglasses while teaching. And, mm -hmm. So that's, that's why well, I asked. Yeah, that definitely can be part of it. The brain does wonderful things and interesting things. And there's so many things that I just don't even know about the brain and the functionality of certain things that go on there. Um, and he's got hearing sensitivity, so he can't be in a loud place the rest of the day. So. Yeah, because of the TBI. Because of the TBI. So a lot of interesting things that happen. Uh, so what do we mean by severity of injury? Well, it depends on the amount of brain tissue that's actually being <coughs> That's what we're looking for. So if you have a small amount, it may not be much at all, but if you have significant brain injury with swelling that starts causing hemispheric shifting, that's deadly. That's potential to never function again. You know, and this happens with strokes as well. When you start having hemorrhagic strokes or you start having patients that fall down a flight of stairs on the elbow, you just fall and hit their head on the ground. I've done a lot of emergency transfers in the past where they've had millimeter, centimeter, or millimeter shifts where the hemisphere is so much pressure that it pushes everything over inside. That causes them to the point that they have to be intubated on a vent because they, they can't function or breathe on their own appropriately. They're sedated, paralyzed, sedated, and put onto a ventilator because of this. And it's some critical things that happen between the different breathing, like that arachnoid uh, type of bleed, subarachnoid bleed, um, subdural bleeds, all different parts of the brain that have different portions of the type of bleed that's there that's causing significant pressure. Now, when they relieve the pressure, do they just drill a hole? Um, I'm not really sure exactly how they do all this. I've never sat through a neuro uh, surgery before. Um, but a lot of the neurosurgeries are done through teleconference now. That's not surgery itself, but they do consults. Um, so if I take a patient, to Portsmouth Hospital, which is a level two, but it's a neuro center. Um, they go to the ER and they bring this TV downstairs to the webcam and then actually talk to the patient from a neurologist from somewhere else in the country. And it's all done right there. And they do the surgery right upstairs. But it's interesting stuff how they do the diagnosis now. Because neurologists are so hard to come by. So they, yeah. they, they, uh, they do teleconference, this are a level one trauma center. And they have to have 24 hour neuro. Interesting stuff. So how do we measure severity? Well, we look at the duration of loss of consciousness. One of the questions you should be asking would be, how long were you up for? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll look over at Trey and say, how long was your friend unconscious for? You know, I want to know the answer to this. This is important for us to document. Um, using the GCS score. Who remembers the GCS score? Six, five, yeah. four. Right, glass of coma scale. What does it measure? What three things does that measure? Motor skills. Motor function. Verbal. Verbal and? Eyes. And eye movement, right? And each one of those runs in a scale of one being the lowest to what number being the highest? Six, five, four. Six, five, and four. So six would be motor function, five would be your verbal response, and four would be your eye movement, right? And in your motor response, it talks about different types of posturing, right? Okay, so if I take my arms and bring my arms up like this, like a boxer stance almost, what kind of posturing is that? What is that is called? that decorative? Decorticate posture, right? Is that bad? Um, right, brainstem activity, I mean, we have brainstem injury. What about this here? The cerebral the injury, right? So these are things we need to look for and document in our GCS score. Now, someone who is dead, what is their score? Three. Three. 
Everybody gets a three at their deck. As low as you can get. The table has a GCS of three. Right? The best you can get is 15. 15 is the highest we go. Uh, looking at a pain scale, zero to 10. Now, I know they teach you one to 10, right? Well, one is still a level of pain. I want to know if you have zero pain or the worst pain you've ever felt. <clears throat> zero to 10. All right, let's start using that scale because one is still a pain number. All right, and then the length of the post traumatic amnesia. How long were they not remembering things for? All right, so when they came off the injury, how long were they altered? So, and I can I, I lean on Rob on some of this stuff here because I know he wrestles a lot of games. It's something that when you when you are wrestling a game, you have someone who really took quite the hit. When they finally wake up, how altered are they? Depends. Depends on the injury, right? It could be on fine, just go play. They and there, be like, I don't know where the hell I am. Others that just kind of do this and go, where the hell am I? Right. <laughs> right? So those are some things that you come in contact with. Um, I've seen it a lot in football, where the helmet the helmet contacts. Um, uh, I don't play hockey at all, but you, know, you do the hockey stuff, so I mean, I don't see the kind of injuries that are there as much. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of fortunate in the area we're in that we don't have a lot of recreational activities here compared to some where we don't have arenas, we don't have downhill skiing, we don't have, you know, at least anything that's sanctioned downhill skiing. I'm sure somebody can find a mountain and go down if they wanted to. But some things to look for. Um, so a mild injury. Uh, considered or considered mild would be a zero to twenty minute loss of consciousness with a GCS of thirteen to fifteen. All right. Uh, the moderate injury would be twenty minutes to six hours of loss of consciousness with a GCS between nine and twelve. And a severe injury would be greater than six hours of loss of consciousness with a GCS score of three to eight. So that's kind of how we kind of determine what kind of type of injury we have in the in, in, really in the field uh, to kind of. Really, it's not going to change our treatment, but it's going to even find out how long things have been going on for. It kind of puts you into kind of a category. This is this is a pretty bad call. Or yeah, I know they had a concussion. We're transporting precautionary. They might have been out for a couple minutes. It's kind of a mild injury, um, and things should go very well for the future. But age plays a difference, right? Health plays a difference. Um, previous injuries, knowing what they were like prior to. What they what they hit their head on? I mean, what they hit their head on exactly. Right? Was it helmet to helmet contact like football? Well, they're designed to take impact, but they can still cause injury. You know, were they outside playing tackle football on their own, out, having fun with the kids, and they get hit in the head, head to head contact? Um, baseball is a big one too, especially if people in the outfield not calling the ball. You know, they collide. You've seen those on ESPN. I've seen those on some of the, the bloopers, things like that. They just Bam, smack the heads off each other, they're both unconscious in the field. What was that PTA? <clears throat> Prior to arrival. Right. Yeah, sorry about that, Rob. I'm trying to skip over that. So what happens as a person with moderate or severe injury uh, begins to recover after injury? What's going on now? But what is the what is the process? Do we know what the process is after we treated? You're looking at What's going on in your body, or yeah, how what's are they going, being treated? How are they being treated? And what's going on in the body as far as the healing process goes? What are your thoughts on that? Well, now what they do with the concussion protocol is they have to be, you know, no school activities, no studying, no physical activity, no activity whatsoever for, you know, depending on the on the injury, depending on their diagnosis. But then they have to do a slow recovery where they can actually start practicing again without. Protective equipment at a snail's pace, and then they work their way up to full contact, which could be anywhere from three weeks after the injury to three months, five months. Right. Later. So the whole protocol laid out for sports injuries now. And a lot of things have changed since back when you know, we were younger and played sports. When you got hit and you had a concussion, you're back in the game. Here's some oxygen here, back in the game you go. Exactly. And we, as referees, we can actually, you know, I've done it several times, told coaches, hey, that kid just took a pretty good thing to the head, and I want to keep an eye on And they've actually pulled him off the game before good. because of that. So. And also, new symptoms, something that can happen. Never new <clears throat> symptoms. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
like weeks to months after. Yeah. So here's kind of an idea of where the brain, looking at the right side versus the left side, on what what body functions are actually happening with the stimulation of different parts of the brain. So as you can see here, like trunk, trunk, arm, and face are on this on the right side of the brain, uh, more towards the, the parietal lobe, kind of in that section there before the temporal, um, and the frontal lobe. Looking at that right now. There. Well, as we have our motor and speech, head and eye movement, right? We have the uh, cerebellum out back. If you look at the left side of the brain, if you look at the temporal lobe here, you see our speech or auditory um, functions run. Then we have our speech visual more towards the back. Our vision control center is actually in the back of the brain in the occipital lobe. Then we have our brain stem going down. Uh, so this is kind of a quick idea of kind of what we're, we're when we have a head injury. You kind of see, okay, well, I know that they hit the back of their head, so I'm expecting blurry vision. It's not going to be a out of the norm uh, sign and symptom. We may see, right? Kind of an idea there. As far as recovery goes, there's multiple stage process. As we know, there's hospital stays, could potential ICU stays. And then once they're done with that, they go to <coughs> neuro rehab centers, so head trauma facility centers. Um, I don't know of any around here. You guys probably know more about that than I do. Um, I know that Kenny Bunk has a, has a great facility in Maine. They have uh, River, River Ridge, which is a great facility over there for head trauma. Uh, New Hampshire used to have a couple good ones. So, but they're out there. And um, you know, we're, we're, I just, I don't know of anything around here. I'm coming in to go more south, but I, I'm not sure. The closest one be around here. But this is, a, this is a continuation for years and years. And then they kind of go through recovery phases on this. But every person is different. Like Rob was mentioning before, you get a slight concussion in the field, you can be back playing again in a month, and then be fully recovered. Or you could have something detrimental to you. So what is the long-term impact of a moderate or severe TBI? Um, obviously, uh, severity of the initial injury plays a big uh, uh, portion of this, but the rate and completeness of the, of the psychological recovery itself. Uh, functions are definitely affected, uh, as we were talking about Pam's friend uh, with that there, and, and even Jordan's friend uh, talking about those functions that were affected from that. Uh, also, uh, meaning of uh, dysfunction to the individual itself. Uh, what resources available for any recovery? You know, or areas of function that are not affected by the TBI. So think, think about that when they come home, the kind of modifications that may have to be made to the home that cost thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, to kind of re redo the home or reconstruct the home to meet the needs of the TBI patient. They could be wheelchair bound for the rest of their lives. We, we just don't know. That's a big change. Um, Other area would be some cognition as well. So obviously you saw mental status changes compared to what they used to be in the past. Other things to look for is like concentration, um, memory, speed of processing. You know, some things they process a little bit slower now. Uh, confusion, language processing, different executive functions, impulsiveness, preservation, attention. These are all different uh, cognitive functions that they may lose um, due to the injury itself. Perseveration. <laughs> what the heck is that? Perseveration. I probably spelled that wrong. Let's see moving. That's not a word. CIA was TBI. All right. Um, obviously, uh, perceptual sensory areas as well, and then also cognitive again. Other sensory uh, perceptual functions would be vision, hearing, smell, uh, vestibular. <coughs> My goodness. Uh, balance, touch, and then taste. We're going to cognitive sensory and seizures as well. Um, recurrent seizures after an injury. <coughs> there are some people that have recurrent seizures that have had seizures before because of a brain injury, or the seizures are what caused the injury, the brain injury. I mean, it's traumatic, but it definitely have impact on a person's life. 
I've seen some from some some homes that have come in when I used to do management stuff in the sports arena. They bring uh, people that were handicapped would come in and they would seize and they would seize for thirty minutes. And like, well, that's normal. Well, in EMT school, <laughs> they said more than more than five minutes is bad. You know, all these people they seize for twenty minutes. Well, their lips are blue. They're not breathing right now. Well, that's okay because that's what they do all the time. We can't stop it. It's like, well, I was everything that's everything we were taught in school. Right, I'm gonna walk away now. Um, but we do have patients like this in town. And some of you, I'm not gonna mention names, but some of you have been there and some have not. But we do have patients in town that have recurrent seizures that last for long periods of time. And also we have other physical changes as well. Um, physical paralysis or uh, spasticity, another one, uh, chronic pain, <coughs> excuse me, control of the bowel or bladder. Uh, sleep disorders are part of this, loss of stamina, appetite changes, you can have menstrual difficulties, uh, regulation of body temperature, right? That's where our temperature control system is located back here, right? And it controls us to you know, stay warm or cold. Or if we're cold, we start to shiver to become warm. If we're warm, we sweat to become cooler again, right? That's where our body regulates temperature. Well, if you have brain stem injuries, your body may not be able to produce this type of function to help you control body temp. So there may be people who or can't feel temperature. So they can sit their hand in a boiling pot of water and not feel a thing. They have no pain reason, they can't feel pain. Right? And that's when they're all burned. Superpowers. It's interesting, right? <coughs> Other ones to add to this would be some social uh, social or emotional. Um, are there any changes in that in your protocol? Emotional changes? Um yeah, I mean, he just said, well, it's more, he has trouble processing things and he yeah. gets he gets very angry, <coughs> frustrated, and that can be because of the situations. Uh, something I've noticed is increased depression in patients that have TBIs, things like that, increased depression. Um, some social, emotional ones here depression, aggression, irritability, lack of motivation, emotional liability, uh, dependent behaviors, disinhibition. Uh, denial, or lack of awareness. These are some kind of the social, emotional things that may go on afterwards. Uh, so, recovery versus improvement. Um, I would say the performance of change would be physical recovery or re education of the individual or environmental modifications. So, the re education is if they are super smart, could turn into someone who's relearning things all over again from a two year old's perspective. Learn how to walk, learn how to talk. You go through all the different therapies, years and years and years of therapies, learn how to do this all over again. It's because of a simple brain injury. Or severe. It all depends on how their body is taking in the injury itself. So, what happens with mild or minor? Honestly, with a mild TBI or the lesser levels of brain damage. So we talked about often referred to as a concussion or brief or no loss of consciousness. Um, long-term impact for about 15% of it. 15% of the cases are usually long-term. Um, don't say that the TBI is really the cause of the deficits that are there. Uh, there's 300,000 sports or recreational injuries per year. People have these different injuries. Uh, what they usually get is a CT, MRI, and EEG. So they check brain function, they look at the, the MRI, look at the CT scan, they kind of look for any types of injuries. I do have some scans you guys can look at at the end of the presentation that are pretty interesting. Uh, so I mentioned this in the EMT class, I'll mention it again here, is have anybody ever seen the movie Concussion before? It's a Will Smith movie. Um, absolutely phenomenal if you want to learn about concussions and, and CT which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy and how tau proteins are released um, within the brain causing more, <coughs> more aggression and deficits and, that mimic early signs of dementia. Great movie to watch. I did, I did some research after watching that movie and it's, it's phenomenal. It usually happens in boxers, but now I'm starting to see it in football. Right, and I just read an article not too long ago, probably within the last three months, of an 18-year-old who died in a car accident 
right? But it was a football player. And they actually cut into his brain and found CTE in an 18-year-old. This early starts with playing football. So a very, very interesting article to read on that, um, but it's there. So it's, a so it's chronic, I'm sorry, or, or ra multiple repetitions of getting hit in the head over and over and over and over again. And they linked it back to, in that movie itself, it was uh, linked back to the center. So if we're losing our football, savvy one that snaps the ball, um, they take most of the hits between linebackers, nose tackles, and things like that coming in to take to go towards the center between the gaps. <clears throat> That's where a lot of the hits are being taken. That center comes up, snaps comes up, and he's going to hit the head constantly. Versus your guards and tackles really aren't being hit as much. They're coming from a stance, looking down, to snap the ball, coming up, and do a pop, and they're getting hit in the head with multiple people, depending on where the gap is they're trying to block. So if you think about it, that takes the most hits as the center to the head. Kind of interesting stuff. If you think about it now, for those who are football fans, look at the center and see how many times he gets hit. Yeah, but you would think that that's going to be at low speed, whereas you know the receivers and the, the running back, right? You know, are getting rocked. They're getting rocked, but the difference is is uh, repetitive impact. Yeah, repetitive impact. Point. I know they've been finding some. They've been doing some autopsies on these retired football players and finding it as well. Yeah. What, what position did uh, that guy play? He died. He killed himself in jail. Um, you know, the, the Pats guy. Nandos? Fernandez, oh. yes. Tight end. Tight end, all right. Because yeah. yeah. he had a severe form. Yeah. Yeah, well, tight ends block, and they also receive, and they throw the ball, and they throw the ball. Yeah. And they're, what their the role is in that. In, in that. <laughs> but the center is when they get the most repetitive hits yeah, versus hard impact, you know. Unless the linebacker is coming in to take the gap, and they come in pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, pretty but if you think about it, nose tackle is coming in, and it's two on one usually. They're trying to break that gap to get both the linebacker come in for a, for a sack. That's usually what's happening there, though, is that that tackle is being in the, the center is being hit repetitively all the time in the head. So, something to think about. That's all. Um, so, other effects of the mild TBI outcomes are the problems. Um, this fear on their own, or about 85% of the cases. So you start getting your compensatory skills, you're coming back, acquired education prevents emotional upset. So they say shatter a sense of self. Well, if you're a star football player, hockey player, and you're like, you're like without that, we can't win without this guy, you know, and they get hit or out of the game for a, for a month out of it, you know, what does that do to the team? What does that do to him emotionally? You know, the schools, like all the students that are all like, you know, pro sports, what, really, you had to go and get hurt, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure on somebody. To be able to carry that team and be out for an injury. So, one of the emotional things as well. Uh, problems are not really attributed to the TBI itself. Mostly it's esteem issues, which means you're out of the game, things like that. Um, the best rehab assessment, obviously, is neuropsych. Neuropsychology has the best ones to go through for rehab. You're saying how it was that 18 year old kid that's the yeah. uh, referee associate of mine down in Middlebury. She's probably one of the best hockey players in the state. Yeah. And at 16, she was coaching at that hockey league. Because, because of the pedigree? Concussions. Okay. She can referee, but she can't play anymore. She's probably, she's probably wow. one, of the best, one of the best hockey players in the state of Wow. Because they're not allowed to hit, right? Because I'm not allowed to hit. Is she playing on that? But the problem is coming up through. They play in the squirts. They don't have separate. Or they don't. You know, they do now, but before it was all you play in the squirts, you create these TVs. If you're better yeah. than the women, you know, the guys, age, yeah. you play with the guys. Yeah. <coughs> Interesting. So how, uh, so, how is the TBI different, or are they the same as a child? As a child? Remember, the brain is always still developing as a kid. So damage as a kid can do a lot more long-term damage. All right? Um, the brain is also more flexible than adults, which can actually take impact better than we can. Um, the fewer educational building blocks that are there, and they really follow the child over time, they may not emerge immediately from the effects. If you talk about infants, and you know, one of the scariest calls we go on, right, is we don't do a lot with kids, 
is, is a kid called an infant called from a fall. And some of the things you look for, especially in the infants, is for intracranial pressure would be what? What do we look for in the head? Depression. Depression and or looking at the soft spot. So if the soft spot is bulging out, that's an indication of in ICP. What if it's depressed in? Good Usually it's dehydration. Yeah, yeah. Usually dehydration. All right. Uh, so it's something to look for. If it's hard, you said me you can't ask you know a, a, a six month old where do you hurt today you know but it's good to assess and feel and yes you can touch the soft spot just don't push on it or rub over it and feel it and see how it feels for children. Uh, so how common is a TBI? More common than real life. Yep. A lot more common than you realize. It's probably a lot more like, well, untreated, too, than... Exactly. There's quite a few. How many times do you fall and hit your head? No. And you get back up and you're like... Center. I did play football. <laughs> I was a goalie and played soccer. How many times did you hit your head off the head. goalpost? I kicked your head a lot. You know? um, so those are some things to, to think about. Good for us. <laughs> well, it's a 4-to-1 ratio, males to females. Uh, 15 to 25 years of age is kind of the the um, the average you'll see TBI is starting to happen. Um, 1.5 million brain injuries per year in the U.S. It's a lot, and alcohol is usually a leading risk factor. It's the uh, hold my beer, watch this. Exactly. Uh, so age second grade will be adolescents and the young adults are the highest rate. Um, so what is the uh, course of treatment for those with TBI? We kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, inpatient rehabilitation programs. Um, coma recovery programs are really used. We don't see a lot of those anymore. Uh, they're there. Um, extended care programs are typically more, are typically inappropriate. So these are key patients, inpatient or outpatient programs and community support services. And so they do have rehabilitation centers for those more severe cases. Kind of an integrated system. Uh, so community post-acute services would be in clinics or at home work or community. So a lot of times they'll have different community projects and things like that if you have a very active community with TBI, um, things like that. So, uh, so residential stuff would be neuro rehabilitation or transitional types of living, um, neuro behavioral intensive, and then long-term supportive living. So there may be someone that comes to your home constantly. You could have someone 24 seven care, or you could be in a home somewhere else in a facility, like a nursing home. These are different associations as well. All right, so looking at this right here, um, do we see the injury, the location of that? Yeah. All right, so we see it more on the left side, correct? So this is the CT scan. We can actually see where the arrow is pointing here. This is where our injury is located at this point. Um, and when we're done with this one here, I'll show you guys a CT on my phone. Some of you guys saw it from the MT class. But when we stop recording, I'll pass my phone and I'll show you the, the uh, scan of a nine-year-old I had. <coughs> this from here. Where do you see it? Yeah, yeah, so uh, right frontal lobe injury. Um, we talk about diffuse axonal injuries here, and then you start seeing some. Um, so as you can see, there's some right here, apparent diffusion um, of this location here, and you can see it here as well of a weighted image. And then obviously the echo image, you can see the spotting under there. It's very hard to see though. But more diffuse on the coefficient map that's on there, and you'll be able to see the injury a little bit better. So. More, what are the little spots? It's just it's showing it's showing the, the injury itself, the bleed okay. of the injury. It's just harder to see on the, the gradient echo, but you can see it better obviously on the, the, the diffusion weight image. You can see it kind of sticks out white, yeah. right? But the thing is though, that the coefficient map comes out a little bit darker, and either way, you can still see where the injury is located. How about here? Yeah. Right? It's like an angry pumpkin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but look at that red spot that's there. Though. 
I think we should have the end of How about here? <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Wait, that's that famous one no, that I wasn't her. like was fine, right? Probably. Ow. All right. So, any questions at all about this? And I'll show you guys that photo once I stop the recording. All right.